practicing what is now called organic farming. But when we started, uh, the stand there were no standards. Uh, we just wanted to farm as sustainably as possible right from the beginning. So we uh, all the dairy, dairy cows from Scotland and Sussex, and we um, started managing them without fertilizer. And, um, we wanted to be self-sufficient. Uh, so our plan now is to grow as much of the food that the cows eat on the farm, which means in our case oats and peas, which we combine and then mill on a roller mill and feed in the form of sort of cow loosely. Uh, and then the bedding for the cows, because of course they're housed in winter, because it rains a lot, and uh, cows need, need to come in winter, dairy cows certainly do. Uh, they're fed silage and hay, which we grow on the farm. And we haven't achieved total self-sufficiency, and it's not our religion, but our aim is, and we believe this is right the way our food system should go, to think about everything that happens on the farm as a kind of miniature ecosystem, where the animals and the plants on it are adapted to the place, and over time, hopefully become uh, better for that. Uh, there was a man called Rudolf Steiner who gave a series of lectures on biodynamic farming in the 1920s, and he said we should think of a farm as an ecosystem, a closed system where the animals and the plants over time become adapted to the place. And this idea of farm as an ecosystem I think is now being validated by modern science. Uh, there's a science called epigenetics. Has anybody heard of that? Which is really, this, it's the observation now understood much more than it ever has been, that all organisms are in a constant dynamic relationship with their external environment. So if you think of ourselves as an individual, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, our emotional state, everything that happened to us, happens to us, has an effect on us at a cellular level. And if we breathe clean air and eat good food free of pollution and meditate perhaps or have an emotionally positive environment, then this will affect us at a, at a, a gene expression level, at a cellular level and it will make us less vulnerable to getting uh, diseases. What happens to us, even emotionally, affects us and has some sort of genetic memory, which is not a mutation, it's somehow held in the genes and which passes down through the generations. So this is why I think it's a very interesting idea that Rudolf Steiner had, uh, that the farm should be managed as an ecosystem because all the plants and their descendants will become adapted to the climate, the soils and the management conditions of the farm over time. And I think that what, if you now look at what's happened to food and farming in the last 100 years or so, but really it's been on an accelerating level over the last 50, 60 years, the post-war period, we've gone in the opposite direction from that. We've globalised our seeds, our livestock breeding, We've industrialised our farming, we've reduced the vitality of the crops that we grow by artificially fertilising them with chemical fertilisers, as a result of which they get sick because it weakens their epigenetic ability to withstand disease threats. And then we've suppressed the diseases with a range of pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides, and in the case of animals, antibiotics and other drugs. And then we fed the resultant degraded, homogenized, industrialized food, not to one, but to two generations of people. And we are really part of a feeding trial, all of us, but the majority of the population. And I think it's really possible to see the impact of that on a declined vitality, uh, impact on the physical health of the nation, and I would argue even a decline in intelligence. This has happened not just in this country, although you could argue that along with the USA, we've kind of led the world in industrializing our farming systems. It is happening all over the world. And if you look at the impact of this on obesity, diabetes, allergies, cancers, untreatable infectious diseases, the evidence is all around us.
and really shocking. There's a sort of resonance, a, a sort of thirst to get back to something which is now emerging amongst young people more, I'd say more so than a couple of generations before. It's very interesting. So there's a great cause for hope there. On the other hand, the current orthodoxy, which is prevailing, I would say, in government circles, in scientific circles, in the leadership of the farmers' unions, and in the food industry, in the chemical industry, and sadly in the research industry, is the age of reductionism and silos and the belief that it's all about quantity, not quality still prevails. So we've got this very interesting juxtaposition of the emergent new shoots of a radically different food movement, at the same time a farming industry which uses industrial language, which is hell-bent on exploiting the last remnants of natural capital, and I would say uh, feeding degraded food in vast quantities uh, to a population that is, has become acclimatized to this kind of food, and even as maybe you uh, become uh, addicted to it in some ways. I think you know, the, the, there are many foods today which uh, children got used to eating, and it's as if their taste buds are tuned into them, and they are in a way forms of addiction. The question all this begs is, <coughs> faced with this very challenging situation with seeds of hope, uh, what should I eat? How should I farm for farmers? What should we eat as we all eat? And if we have any involvement with farming, how should we farm to address these unparalleled challenges in the history of humanity? Because that's the truth. Of the, because the population is so large, our technological capacity is so great, the threat, literally, I think, to the survival of humanity as we know it is in question. So either we could take uh, control or take responsibility for what we've done to the planet, really during my lifetime, and do it differently from now on, to scale, or we're going to witness all the things we are already witnessing, uh, the huge food insecurity, migration, uh, a decline in um, public health, which is catastrophic for in terms of the treatment. Um, food which is produced industrially appearing cheap and it really isn't cheap at all uh, because of the hidden costs which don't appear on the, on the price label um, and a generation which will witness uh, really uh, taking the earth to the edge of a planetary catastrophe so the way I think that this, this uh, situation can empower us is because we eat and because through what we eat we can have a major influence on the future of farming. So, uh, what should we eat and how should we farm? We should, I would argue, eat food which is not, which comes from sustainable farming systems, which has the minimum uh, input of pesticides and chemical fertilizers, and we should eat food which is compatible with the farming systems in relation to the staple foods which are around us. So, if you live in London, Let's say the food footprint of London is vast and it's arguably bigger than the UK, but in terms of the staple foods, the fresh vegetables, the salads, the dairy products, the eggs and the grains and the fresh meat, I would say a sustainable diet would be not only as local as possible, in, in the UK that means probably relatively regional, but ideally from farms and from farming systems you know something about and in an ideal world that actually you know the farms or know of the farmers. But also it, you should eat in proportion to the productive capacity of those farms under sustainable management. And this is where I think things have gone very wrong at the moment because there's a thing called the Eating Better Coalition, which is an alliance of environmental NGOs who have come up with this uh, blanket thing, eat less meat, which is obviously a good thing because we're probably eating too much meat. But I think the problem with that is that they fail to differentiate between the meat which is part of the problem and the meat which is part of the solution. Here you have a so-called arable estate in the Cotswolds, uh, and yet under sustainable management, and this is an exemplar of sustainable management, 
80% of the farmed area is in forage or grass. Now, if you are a farmer and you're growing forage or grass, you can't eat, we can't eat it. So what's the farmer going to do? Just say, well, that's part of the fertility rule based on the rotation. Or are they going to turn the forage and grass into something that people eat? That means red meat, lamb, beef, or it means dairy for us. Or it could mean poultry, because they can derive about a third of their diet from grazed grass or eggs, chicken or uh, or even pigs. Pigs don't have a rumen, which is the way that you can digest certain things, but they can graze grass and they can eat a percentage of silage. So straight away you have a structural need to eat. If you were to eat from the farm and eat from the footprint of the farm, then red meat in particular, which has had terrible press because of methane emissions, is actually part of the solution as long as it's grass fed and not grain fed. So, a sustainable diet, I'm not trying to preach anti-vegetarianism or veganism, I'm just simply saying that if you want to align your diet with the productive capacity of Dalesworth, which is the perfect beacon case study of proper sustainable management, then red meat in particular, but also white meat and dairy products are part of the structural necessity to produce food in this rotation. So here am I, wanting to farm sustainably, I want to do the thing that's right by climate change, that's right by the soil fertility, that's right by all the animals under my stewardship and the crops under my stewardship. And I need people who get that, who have a sophisticated understanding of what farms can produce and are loyal to the products of that farm because that's what they understand is truly sustainable. On this farm here, on my farm, if you have a look around my farm, walk around Dalesworth, you will see that in action because you will see there is an enormous amount of biodiversity which is coexisting with the vegetable production, which is in the hedges, which is not being sprayed out with pesticides. So all the wildlife can actually coexist with really quite efficient food production. So, I mean, to me, this sort of farming, farming with the great nature, I've been at it for 40 years, so I've been I'm just at the beginning. I really feel like I'm, you know, new to it, because I know that the productive capacity of my farm can go to much, much higher level just if I'm a student of soil fertility and a student of looking at these relationships and a student of epigenetics. Soils are, soils are the stomach of the plant. If you think of the soil, as each plant has a root zone. It spends 30% of its energy exuding sugary sap into the root zone, which it does to nourish a symbiotic community of fungi and bacteria. So the plant's stomach is the soil in its root zone. And it depends on the fungi and the bacteria in its root zone to digest the organic matter, which it can't do on its own. I realise through all this stuff that I'm just at the beginning of a new sort of chapter of stewardship of my own soil. And I need to think of the soil of my farm like the collective stomach of all the plants on it. And what I do, whether it's putting compost onto it or we're, we're making cheese so we're putting the whey back onto the land, and we need to aerate it, and what plants we sow, and the diversity of the plants, and when we graze the cattle, and also how intensively we graze them, where we've adopted a system of what's called holistic grazing or mob grazing, where we move the cattle, we graze the cows intensively, and then we move them on. All this affects the biology of the soil. And we're entering the age of biology in agriculture, and Dalesford is basically a pioneering example of a biological approach. How long does it take to make a non-organic farm organic? Technically, two years of conversion. Uh, so if you start with a you know, field which has been in intensive production and you convert it, then there are some sort of shortcuts, but basically it's a two-year conversion period. In America, it's three years. But to me, in a way, creating a world of either you're organic or you're you know, intensive, is less interesting to me now than thinking about how all farmers can adopt more sustainable methods. And I know we need to have an organic market because it separates the food that you can trust from the food which maybe you can trust less. But I think one of the problems of the organic food is it's polarised the farm community. You know, intensive ones are bad, organic ones are worthy and good. And I think what we needed now is to measure sustainability and apply those metrics to all farms. I want to think, is my soil carbon better than last year? How's my nutrient cycling? How's my biodiversity index? I want to go higher. I'm not saying I don't want to, I mean, we're selling our 
products is organic. But in terms of sustainability, I think we need to have a new psychology about this instead of separating people into two communities. Mm -hmm. Economists call them externalities. So an externality is an unpriced impact. Could be bad, could be good of a particular system. So because we have a failure to put a proper price on the negative externalities, organic food's got an elitist image, which is totally unfair. Mm -hmm. And so we need to do something about that. But that's why I mean, is it better to sort of take away that organic label behind it and make it more about sustainable and what's in the soil and how, you know, that side of things, that story rather than the organic story? I personally think, as personal opinion, and you know, I, come, I can say this because it's against myself to a degree, marketing people have a term, show, don't tell. Mm. So I don't think we should say to people, eat more organic food. I think you should say the issues are antibiotics, the microbiome, epigenetics, pollution of you know groundwater, pesticide poisoning. We have developed a system which is defined amongst other systems as in the organic standards for better or worse, which is an attempt to deal with those issues. So I think we need a sophisticated understanding of the issues and then allow people to make their own choices. Would it, make, would it maybe make sense to have like a, a like a level system for a farm rather than having just your either organic or not so people know how sustainable you are so like it is a ladder, it's like level one, level two, level three so that people know that it can be trusted but it might not be 100% organic but they are doing their bit for the environment by choosing that over something else that's not. I think that would be a really good thing but I think that isn't mutually exclusive from having an organic label so for instance, supposing sustainability seems to find with 100 points 10 points for soil, 10 points yeah. for biodiversity, this is just arbitrary. And I'm 65, <coughs> if I want to be 68, you could see, like on a fridge label, yeah. you could see I'm, I'm, you know, have on cheese from my farm, 65. Yeah. But I don't use GMOs, and I don't use pesticides, yeah. so I'm actually organically certified, but you can see my label, my score. Yeah. So you can see somebody else who's not certified, the 63, but they're doing a lot of things right. They just don't have to be certified. I mean, Lincolnshire poacher cheese, that's another cheddar that, you know, produced by a friend of mine. He's not certified. He's doing most things right. As a consumer, I think it's really important that, it's, um, that you can know that the uh, produce is produced organically because there is such a plethora of other standards out there already. As you mentioned, like red tractor or leaf standards. If you buy pork, for example, it might be outdoor bread or free range or whatever. And most of these terms are, in my opinion, worthless. Um, they're mainly marketing terms um, and not really substantial uh, in terms of what they're ethically doing or um, sustainably doing. Um, they are merely ways of trying to say that food is well produced because obviously most people buy things from the supermarket yeah. so they need that branding, you know, that recognition. So I would be concerned if at this stage without a suitable, really good system to replace that, then organic, the discipline of organic standard would be really worrying. We need to shift to a more inclusive approach because if we do not get mainstream sustainable agriculture, meaning organic, if you want to use a proxy word, yes. we're doomed. You know, I mean, we can't have this like 5% organic market or even less than that actually, and 95% intensive. I mean, that is not going to save the planet. Mm -hmm. So I think the psychology of this has to be more inclusive we need to make sure that if there are new metrics, that they don't wipe out the organic brand, they support it. Right. So. Well, on that cheerful note. <laughs> <laughs> no, in this course for optimism. There is, there's an opportunity now, definitely, for the new government, and uh, yeah. things are going to have to change, and it's yeah. down to you, Patrick, to make sure they change in the oh, right. direction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much.